Uh, this remote hearing is being conducted pursuant to rule 10.01. And uh, the remote hearing can be viewed on the uh, house webcast online. Uh, the legislative uh, committee uh, assistant will take the role. Chair Noor. Present. Vice Chair Jay Shong. Vice Chair Zhong. Lead Hamilton. Present. Baker. Uh, Baker. Baker. Baker present. Baker present. Dabney. Dabney. Frankie. Dabney present. Dabney present. Frankie. Frankie present. Greenman. Greenman present. Haley. Present. Jurgens. Present. Kegel. Present. Katiza Watoon. Here. Olson. Present. Tu Zhong. Present. Vice Chair Jay Zhong. Present. Dabney. I, th yeah. I think he's already uh, said yeah, uh, okay. present. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, sorry about that. Dabney present. Dabney present. Chair, we have quorum. Uh, thank you, Jason uh, Chavez. Uh, there's a quorum present. Members, I will now entertain a motion to to I'll, I'll now entertain a motion to approve the minutes for February 3rd. So moved, Mr. Chair. Representative Jay Zhong moves the uh, approval for minutes for February 3rd. Uh, any discussions? Any discussions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Abstentions? See none. So the minutes for February 3rd have been approved. Members, today we have a presentation from the Center for Rural Policy and Development. Uh, I just wanted to give members, uh, you know, approximately 30 minutes, we're going to be discussing uh, the rural policy and development conversation. Uh, we do have two presenters. Uh, we have Julie Tesh and Kelly Ash. So please uh, welcome to the committee and introduce yourself. And if you have any presentation, I'm assuming uh, you will be sharing with all of us. Uh, so please uh, welcome, introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you very much, Chairman Nor, members of the committee. My name is Julie Tash, and I'm the president and CEO of the Center for Rural Policy and Development. Thank you for inviting us to your committee. Um, we had a great meeting with, with Committee Administrator Travis a couple of weeks ago, and very happy to be invited. Um, just so you know, in rural Minnesota, I live in rural Waseca County, and Kelly, our research associate, he is in uh, the New London area. So we we uh, all live in rural and we have one other coworker as well and she lives in Mankato. But just to give you a quick rundown, if you haven't heard of us before, again, we're the Center for Rural Policy and Development and we were created actually in 1997 to become a rural Minnesota think tank on policy. And our job is to do the non-biased, non-partisan research to give back to all of you, our legislators and our policymakers, so that you can get information from a rural lens that is accurate. Um, like I said before, we're based in greater Minnesota. Our staff all live in greater Minnesota. <laughs> New London, what county is that? Is that Lacroix Representative Baker? Maybe. <laughs> um, but we are nonpartisan and nonprofit. Uh, we do have 19 board members, 14 of which, actually 15 of which are appointed by the governor. So we go through uh, the governor's office for appointments. And then, like I said, we have three staff members. Next, Kelly. Thank you. And again, it is a lot of people ask like, so really like, what do you do? So what we do is we take those complicated and complex issues and present them in ways that give them meaning and relevance. So today you're going to be hearing about our latest workforce report on how the pandemic has affected greater Minnesota. And so we like to take that information, condense it down and give it to you so that you can make the best policy decisions possible. Um, our research, I always like to remind people, our research is not designed to determine public policy, but to inform decision makers like yourselves. We also do quite a bit of work with county commissioners, um, county administrators, uh, League of Minnesota Cities, Association of Minnesota Counties, likewise. 
quickly want to go over our research agenda. What we do every year is we ask legislators like yourself and decision makers across the state for input on what are you seeing in your areas in greater Minnesota? Or for those of you in the urban and suburban areas, what are you hearing about that you have questions about that you think are really important topics that we should be addressing from a policy standpoint? And we put out a survey every year to about 2000 people and all of you will receive that survey here in a, about two months to find out what are those issues that we should be looking at next year. So our year runs uh, same as Minnesota. So our fiscal year starts July 1. So that's when our new research agenda starts. So um, again, be looking for that uh, questionnaire coming out here in the next couple of months, but we greatly value what it is that you uh, want to be hearing about. And so with that, I am going to turn it over to the esteemed Kelly Ash from Lackawaparo County. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Julie. And just quick correction, it's Candy Yohai County. Um, Thank you very much. <laughs> Damn it. Sorry, I'm no sorry. Problem. At least no I didn't problem. say like, you know, Steel County or something. That's my name. <laughs> no, uh, Candy Yohai County, so northern part, uh, just north of Wilmer. Uh, most people know where Wilmer is, so New London. Eliash, um, if you may introduce yourself and your uh, title uh, for the committee, please proceed. Yep. yep, sounds good. Uh, my name is Kelly Ash. I'm the research associate for the Center for Rural Policy and Development. I just recently uh, published a report looking at workforce uh, in rural Minnesota. And uh, uh, over the, actually, we've been focused on rural workforce shortages over the last three years, kind of diving in deep on what those shortages look like, uh, what types of jobs are available, and also what's going on in the workforce development organizations and kind of our ecosystem of workforce development and where some of the issues and opportunities that they're seeing. <clears throat> and this is this slide just shows uh, before the pandemic, uh, the chart on the left there is each planning region in Minnesota. And it's the number of job vacancies each year as a percentage of the total filled jobs in each region. So the higher the percentage, generally the harder it is to fill those jobs. <clears throat> and as you can see, uh, the red line is actually the seven county metro. Uh, and there's always a lot of conversation about all the jobs and opportunities in the seven county metro, which is definitely true, but actually from a job vacancy standpoint, um, it uh, was lower than the rest of uh, Minnesota, and actually the highest uh, job vacancy rate was in southwest Minnesota, uh, followed by northwest and northeast Minnesota. Those regions typically have been having over 5% job vacancy rate. We consider 3% to be quite healthy. 6% uh, is insane, uh, and that's pretty much impossible to fill jobs there. There was also um, some reports flying around about what types of jobs these were, and there were some statements made that these weren't good jobs, they're not well-paying jobs. Uh, when we dug into it, uh, that wasn't true at all. And actually, um, we saw job vacancies uh, growing in every occupation and industry in rural Minnesota with really good wages. And actually, the um, uh, median wages for job vacancies, uh, the fastest growth in those wages were occurring in rural Minnesota. For the seven county metro, uh, job vacancy wages were uh, staying relatively flat, particularly since 2010. And so this is actually at a point in time when uh, the gap between wages is the closest they have ever been. Um, also, there was a growing number of jobs offering health benefits, and like I said, all vac uh, vacancies now nearly all like, occupations and industries. So that was kind of our previous report. Now, since then, we've oh, and here's uh, the four reports. So we looked at the data, which was report number one, and then we looked at all the different ways in which uh, workforce development organizations and employers were working together to kind of help fill this gap, this workforce shortage. And so I uh, was looking at household recruitment, recruitment initiatives, which has been popping up all over rural Minnesota, you know, ways of promoting their regions as great places to live and work. What does that look like? And how is that an economic development tool now? Um, finding, uh, engaging populations with high barriers to employment. So this included how organizations and employers were engaging folks with previous uh, criminal background histories, uh, immigrant and refugee populations, uh, people in poverty um, and things like that in order to engage populations that weren't participating in the labor force at high rates in previous years. And then the fourth one uh, was how we're changing the story on careers for rural high schoolers. You know, everybody knows the story about you graduate high school and you leave our rural areas. And back in the 70s and 80s, that was probably the right thing to do because the rural economy was, was not fantastic, but that isn't the case anymore. And so. How do we shift that narrative so rural high schoolers actually know about some of the careers uh, that are available to them? And uh, so there was a lot of interesting stuff. I highly recommend checking out uh, those reports and we'd be happy to send those to you. So we have a pandemic now. And so the question that got posed to us is what is that research and what is that workforce shortages and supply of workers look like now that the pandemic is hitting? So that's what we dug into here. 
Real quickly, and this is just a summary of what we saw, um, the data says essentially we now have a pool of workers to engage, uh, particularly from occupations in food prep and serving related, sales and related, and office administrative support. Surprisingly, we also have a significant workforce shortage in nearly all other occupations in rural Minnesota. Uh, when we talked to one workforce development organization, uh, they essentially said, we are still in a workforce shortage, uh, just masked by the pandemic. Um, and, and this isn't just a short-term issue. When we look at the projections and the models looking forward, this is a long-term issue that we're gonna have, uh, probably gonna have uh, see workforce surpluses in certain occupations while having significant shortages in other occupations. So I'm gonna dig in here a little bit with you guys and kind of show what this looks like. Um, before I overload you with lots of information, I just wanna make a couple clarifications. I'm gonna be talking about occupations, not industries. Um, you're, you guys all know about this, you're on this committee, so you understand the difference. Um, so just keep in mind that I'm talking about occupations, not industries. And this is the color scheme I'm gonna be looking for. I broke everything down by planning region, uh, which isn't fantastic. Uh, I love doing things at a little bit more granular level, county is best. Um, I do have this data by EDR. If anybody's interested, I'd be happy to send that out. But just so you know, this is what the colors look like. So depending on what region you're in, that's the color you wanna look for. So finding number one, uh, there's now a potential pool of labor that didn't exist before in rural Minnesota. So this is the unemployment roller coaster. Um, this is the uh, continuous unemployment insurance claims each week as a percentage of 2019 annual employment. So going through 2020, pretty obvious to see when the pandemic hit uh, and you had this huge increase, right? So un unemployment claims as a percent of annual employment hit hardest in central and in Northeast Minnesota. Uh, and then you saw this kind of gradual decline throughout the summer as people kind of got back to work, things started opening up again. And then this kind of blip here on the right side where it started to increase again. But one thing's really important when we look at unemployment, particularly in rural areas, um, we have unemployment caused by the pandemic and then we have seasonal unemployment. And this is a big deal in rural Minnesota because we have a lot of employers that have kind of an ebb and flow in the way they use their workers. And so during the winter time, um, we typically see really high unemployment rates in rural Minnesota because we lay off a lot of workers that are in construction and extraction and things like that. So we actually want to try and take that apart and figure out which one is which, what's seasonal and what's caused by the pandemic. And the best way to do that is to compare trends. So I, uh, this next chart here actually is showing the difference between the unemployment rate in 2019 in, uh, uh, in each planning region versus the unemployment rate in 2020. And so you can see, like, if it was a very typical year, these lines would be right around zero, right? You wouldn't see a lot of change because they kind of follow the seasonal pattern. Well, you can see the difference between 2019 and 2020 here. The hardest hit was actually in Northeast and the Twin Cities where they had an uh, unemployment rate that was seven percentage points higher than they did in 2019, right around May there. This gradual decline. And then what's interesting is you can see at the end here where a lot of the, court, a lot of the uh, regions had that quite that up tick, particularly in rural areas, a lot of that was largely due to seasonal because uh, the low, the, the uh, unemployment rate here, particularly in Northwest and Southwest, are only about 0.3 to 0.6 percentage points higher uh, by November than they were in 2019. Um, and so that just shows us that, that a lot of that blip where you saw higher unemployment rates, particularly at the end of 2020, those are expected higher unemployment uh, numbers because of seasonal work. And so we broke it down by occupation. We did some analysis and we saw that essentially these are, we could break up the unemployment into three different pools. Um, occupations that were in food prep and serving related, sales and related and office administrative support were hit really hard. Um, and it was very different this year than it was in last year. So we kind of figure it's impacted by the pandemic. And then by, you know, even today you'll see high unemployment and construction extraction, production and transportation material moving, but that's largely due to seasonal changes in the industry. So the other question I know you guys, are, uh, are, you folks are all grappling with is this idea of like who's participating in the labor force. So we have unemployment and we have people participating in the labor force. And these are kind of, um, they're kind of a muddy definitions, but here's how it works. And I'm sure you guys probably already know this, but the, this big circle on the left here are all the people participating in the labor force. And there's two, two types, right? So there's employed people. They're obviously participating in the labor force. But we also have unemployed folks that are seeking work or uh, seasonal workers that are also participating in the labor force, even though they're not currently employed. And then we have folks not participating in the labor force and they are unemployed and not seeking work. Um, and so that's kind of what that means. And so we actually um, have been hearing a lot about people dropping out of the workforce. And so we wanted to figure that out too. 
And it's important to understand, just like unemployment, there's fluctuations throughout the year and seasonal changes in people participating in the labor force. So I'm just going to use an example here. This is one Southwest planning region. Then this is looking at 2019. So a very kind of just normal year, non-pandemic year. And this is indexed. And so essentially, if we had, let's say, 100,000 workers in January of 2019, by the end of that year, they had about 3% more uh, people participating in the labor force by the end of that year. And that's that's pretty typical, right? Uh, the past few years, Southwest has done a really good job at getting more people into the labor force, where otherwise they've kind of had a downward trajectory due to having not having enough people to uh, fill jobs. Um, so this is what that looks like. So we want to compare this to what happened this year. So this is again Southwest. This orange line was the 2019 number. You just saw the blue line. This is the trend in 2020. And you can see where the pandemic hit here. A lot of people dropped out of the labor force. Increase over the summer, another drop off. And you'll see there's a gap, right? So, you know, if it was like 2019, we would like to see by November being really close to that 3% more and participating in the labor force. But instead, Southwest has 1.3% more uh, participating in the labor force compared to January 2020. So we know something's going on. So this is each of those regions. And you can see, again, the seven county metro and northeast is pretty bad. Um, so Northeast, uh, compared to January of 2020, they have 4.6% less people participating in the labor force compared to 2019 when they actually saw a little bit of growth in their labor force. Um, and you can see there's gaps everywhere else. So essentially where they were in 2019 isn't where they're at uh, in 2020. Central is pretty bad, 2.3% less. Um, so this, 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 what this tells us is that even though we've seen declining unemployment rates, we're also seeing declining people participating in the labor force, meaning they fell off unemployment, but also fell off uh, uh, taking a job. So that's really what this is telling us. And this is a pretty unique situation. It's pretty rare that you see things like this. And so we really have two sides of the impact with two pools of labor. We kind of have this business side where businesses were impacted by the pandemic and they had to lay off workers. And that's usually in that food press, uh, food prep, sales related and office administrative support. We also have this other factor, people dropping out of the labor force, making a choice not to work. And it's, you know, from research that we've seen and the anecdotal information that we've heard, it kind of falls under this people having just, this is kind of a chaotic time. And so you got childcare is probably the number one reason we hear um, of people dropping out of labor force. We also have older workers, particularly in Northeast, and that's a big reason why I think we see such a drop off in Northeast Minnesota with older workers. They're probably a little bit more nervous about going into the workforce, particularly in occupations where you're interacting with people a lot more. Um, so we're seeing that quite a bit and just common health areas, right? You also have this last piece where it's a pretty unique time in which we uh, are, are no longer requiring any sort of employment search ben, uh, tied to the unemployment benefits, which you guys probably all know, right? So uh, during the pandemic, since people were being laid off, kind of hoping it would be temporary, we waived the, the, the searching for work uh, requirement in order to see, receive unemployment benefits while also increasing some of the benefits to kind of help people out right now. So you have a lot of factors playing into why people are making the choices they're making, um, both uh, financial. So fiscally, if they're going to be able to get unemployment, they're probably going to stay on it while they can help resolve some of these life, uh, life impact issues as well. So it's very complex um, and it's, it's a difficult time. So findings number two, uh, workforce sur surpluses were concentrated in a few occupations while shortages persist in most others. I'm going to show you some jobs data. Typically what I use when I look at job vacancies, I look at the job vacancy survey by deed, which is really super accurate, but it has a little bit of a lag and it only comes out twice a year. So when we had to look at the jobs data for the pandemic, I needed something a little bit more um, consistent and a little bit more uh, uh, time uh, related so it was quicker. And I could actually get weekly data uh, from deed using the National Labor Exchange. And the National Labor Exchange is a little bit different. They have a piece of software that essentially combs all of these job boards. Uh, through software and compiles them and provides all the data. It's a really sweet system. Um, and what's great about it is I can get it every week, but what's terrible about it is it's going to underestimate a lot of jobs, particularly in rural areas. So it's not completely accurate. Um, and we'll see that in a little bit here. So we compare the job vacancy rate in 2019 for each planning region uh, versus the job vacancy rate September through November of 2020. We did those three months because it was far enough from the initial impact of the pandemic while also being before uh, the restrictions that were put in place again uh, in uh, later in November and December, uh, just to kind of get a sense of like how are things gonna recover and how quickly. 
And you can see the job vacancy rate here is about two percentage points off from where it was in 2019 uh, through those uh, three months, which again is significant, but it, I was actually still pretty shocked. Again, like I said, 3% is pretty healthy and every region is above uh, 3%. So even during a pandemic, we still have a lot of jobs available, um, uh, which is uh, pretty impressive. What kind of jobs were available throughout our regions? Um, you'll see the, this is ranked by the most job openings, uh, the top five here. Uh, in Northwest, we have production, healthcare practitioners and technical, it's almost consistently number one or two. Uh, production is always up on top. And then Seven County Metro is actually office and administrative support. Um, um, and so, yeah, that's kind of what you're seeing here is just a, a kind of across the board, a lot of different types of occupations uh, that people are advertising for. Now, for any of you that are paying attention, you're probably looking at this and being like, well, wait a minute here. You just told me that there's high unemployment rate in, let's say, oh, what's one? Food preparation and serving related, but yet it's also got the second highest uh, job vacancies in Northeast Minnesota. Yeah, that's kind of the time we're living in. I pulled this out. This is Northwest Minnesota. So this is the top five occupation groups uh, on, with the highest unemployment. And you can see food preparation and serving related is number one with the most unemployment. But if we look at job postings, it's got the fifth most job postings. So it's a very interesting time, right? Like this isn't a typical kind of economic impact where people are unemployed because there's no jobs available. This is people being unemployed because there's lots of different stuff going on. Um, it's an added wrinkle to this whole situation. And I don't envy you guys because you got to make some tough choices here as to uh, showing compassion while also trying to do what's best uh, moving folks into careers that might be a little bit better for them, uh, particularly in the future as we start talking about future projections. It's tough. So uh, yeah, I, I can go ahead and stop. I see I have a hand raised here, uh, um, uh, Chairman Nor. Is it okay if I take questions? Uh, if you prefer to take questions, uh, but I usually say, uh, let's finish the presentation so you, we may get the answers uh, through the presentation. Okay, yeah, I can, I, can, I can only see five of you anyway, so I'd feel bad if, if, if folks have their hands up and I can't see it. So I'll keep going then. Thanks, Chair, Chairman Nor. Um, so we wanted to look at workforce shortages because, you know, we could have a lot of job postings, but we could also have a lot of unemployment uh, in that occupation group. So we kind of wanted to see for workforce development organizations, it's, it's more uh, relevant to kind of figure out where are our shortages and where do we need to do some training. And so that's what we, we did here. And we did that analysis. And this is kind of what it looks like. Again, we're going to see surpluses food prep serving related. So even though it was high unemployment rates or high unemployment numbers in that occupation group, there was also still a high number of uh, not enough jobs to hire all of them back. And so we would see a surplus in food prep and serving related, also sales related and office administrative support. And this is kind of generalized. It's a little bit of nuance as you move around Minnesota, but it's pretty typical. Shortages and pretty much everything else. And I'll just say it right here, healthcare practitioners and the technical is number one. You could break it down by EDR and it was essentially number one or two um, across the entire state of Minnesota. Uh, production was quite high, transportation, material moving, architecture and engineering, computer and mathematical. These are um, um, occupation groups where we saw more job postings than folks being unemployed within those occupation groups. Findings number three, uh, these trends are projected to continue. Um, so just real quick, I'm, just, uh, I'm gonna show some charts uh, that are gonna show the historical employment from 2016 to 2020. I'm gonna show the baseline projection. So essentially what was the employment projection going to look like before the pandemic hit? So as they ran those model numbers before the pandemic hit, what were those numbers gonna look like? And now that the pandemic hit, what are those models saying? We're gonna compare that um, just to kind of give us a sense of like, what are the impacts? Again, I'm gonna use Southwest Minnesota here uh, as, my, uh, as my example. So this uh, kind of lighter blue uh, uh, on the left here with all the dots, that's a historical employment. You can kind of see it's been going, you know, the trending downwards. We've had a few uh, years, these past few years where it's gone up, but then um, um, uh, it's important to know that this, uh, this uh, kind of this blue line on top of the darker blue line here, that's the baseline model. So that was the projections before the pandemic hit. And you can see it was gonna do kind of a downward trajectory. I just wanna make sure it's clear that this downward trajectory usually gets misread or maybe it's just an incorrect narrative that um, it's due to a lack of jobs and opportunity in Southwest Minnesota. And that is absolutely not the case. Um, typically when we look at these numbers and the models are actually showing that the downward trajectory is due to a lack of people to fill jobs. Um, um, so that's why that trend exists. It's not because there's a lack of jobs. So 
that's important. And then this dark blue is the projections ran after the pandemic hits. And you can see, again, it's doing that downward trajectory, but you see this gap between the two. So that loss of about uh, eight, nine, 10, about 4,000 jobs or 4,000 employment is largely due to businesses closing uh, or those jobs that's being eliminated because of uh, the pandemic. Uh, and so those aren't due to the loss of people, but rather um, uh, just the, the case that the particularly bars, restaurants, and those types of things that got hit pretty hard are going to take a long time to recover. Um, uh, and that's kind of nationally, that's kind of what we're seeing as well. So this is each region. And as you can see, each region, uh, looking at those comparisons, they're pretty much the same gap <laughs> uh, going across all of Minnesota. No one got hit harder or worse. And again, these are projections, so they're not they're not awesome, but uh, they're the best we have. So we looked at the uh, projections again by occupations, and it, they continue to show this, this widespread workforce shortages in healthcare practitioners and technical community and social services, management, architecture. I could go on and on, almost all of them. We will continue according to projections, right? And Minnesota tends to do better than projections, so let's just keep that in mind. Um, but we would continue to see widespread workforce surpluses in food preparation, serving-related building and grounds cleaning, office and administrative support, personal care, and sales and related. And at least that's what the projections are showing. There's one kind of nuance or wrinkle uh, in rural Minnesota that's always kind of interesting. A lot of people don't pay attention to this is that uh, projections are typically wrong, particularly in these three occupations for rural Minnesota. Over the past 10 years, um, projections have shown that there would be the projected employment decreases in farming, fishing, and forestry production and transportation and material moving. And every year it's been wrong. Um, and actually the, there's been an increase in employment in those three occupations. Um, and if there isn't, it's because there's not enough people to fill the jobs. It's not because of a lack of the jobs available in those three uh, occupations. Um, the projections try to consider that things are gonna become automated um, or they're gonna outsource and things like that. And for whatever reason, rural Minnesota continues to just really do well uh, in these three occupations, or I should say not, maybe not do well, but beat the projections uh, in terms of employment, um, which is kind of interesting. So if that's the case, then uh, these numbers are actually underestimating the number of workforce shortages we're probably gonna be seeing over the next five years. So uh, my last finding here is investments in workforce development are, are kind of key right now. Um, so we have an opportunity and a problem. We have a pool of labor, which um, as terrible as it is and as hard as it is on our families, um, it's also a time, uh, an opportunity, particularly for our workforce development organizations that they haven't seen in quite a while. Um, unemployment has been so low in rural Minnesota that this is just kind of like, oh, okay, now we have this pool of labor. Let's get to work. Let's do something uh, with these folks. And so, um, so that we have that. Um, the issue is that the jobs available will require certification training, post-secondary education. Not surprisingly, this has kind of been an ongoing thing. Um, but the occupations that have been hit particularly hard and are projected to continue to get hard um, aren't well aligned um, with the jobs that are projected to be available uh, in the future. And so this is where our workforce development organizations stay, uh, uh, stand in. So we interviewed uh, the, our workforce development boards and our local uh, deed folks, um, all just really fantastic people. I have so much respect for Minnesota's workforce development uh, ecosystem. It's really probably uh, one of the top five in the nation as far as how good they are and how robust it is. Um, they, we got, well, there's kind of four themes of some of the challenges they're facing right now. So one is connecting workers to local services. You guys probably know this already, but uh, you know, due to the pandemic um, and everything being online, there's a lack of, uh, of uh, people that go on unemployment, there's no longer that kind of orientation that used to take place in the local uh, career force uh, offices. Uh, and there's a really difficult way for our local workforce development organizations to reach out to unemployed folks um, because of some of that contact information, there's some restrictions on that being shared. There's no longer that in-person orientation. It's just a little bit harder right now. And so that's a big deal. And you, know, you talk to any workforce development organization right now, and they'll say, we know there's a lot of folks unemployed or not working right now, but we're not as busy as we should be. And I think it's because there's kind of that lack of connection right now. Because everything has shifted online, broadband and technology has become an issue too. So for the folks that are trying to reach out, um, definitely um, dealing with people that maybe don't have access to the technology to take uh, part in some of the services that are available for work, from our workforce development organizations. Um, and I would even argue techn uh, technology literacy uh, can be an issue uh, as well. 
There's also this third piece, this timing, which I thought was interesting. It's not something I thought of, but almost every workforce development organization is kind of worried about it. And I mentioned it before that our workforce development organizations um, feel like they're not as busy as they should be coming from the unemployed side of things. Um, but there's this nervousness that uh, in March, uh, when the unemployment benefits kind of run out and if they don't get renewed and as things start to recover, the vaccines get out, jobs start to kind of pop up, schools are back in, childcare starts to get back to normal, that they're gonna get swamped with people uh, wanting to find uh, employment again and things like that. And so there's this timing issue of like, when is that gonna hit and are we gonna be able to handle it? Because it's a lot of folks. Uh, and the last thing, last theme uh, was organizations feeling a little bit stretched thin. So you are, we are dealing with obviously uh, unemployed folks, but also through the WIOA, so the Workforce Improvement and Opportunity Act, there's been a huge push for our workforce development boards and I would say workforce development organizations as a whole to really engage employers. And this has been happening over four years since unemployment has been so low. A lot of the work has focused on working with employers and how to connect uh, the unemployed folks or people not participating in the labor force and how to do that work well and how do we do um, in-house training and things like that and it's really really gone really well it's been I think probably one of the the biggest improvements in the workforce development field over the past five years uh, out of everything that's happened um, but while they're doing that they're also trying to now have to focus on assisting and helping the unemployed folks so there's kind of this stretch thin feeling uh, that our workforce development organizations are feeling so as Julie said we don't make you know we're not going to tell you this is our policy solution, um, uh, but more just things to think about, because I know a lot of you guys are focused on, you know, what does this mean for workforce development? Um, and so here's some recommendations that we think at least to consider and think about. Um, so the first thing we would say is any new programming or funding, um, just give it the flexibility for our local workforce development organizations to implement. Uh, there's been some times in the past, I'd say over the past three or four, maybe even five years, that a lot of the funding and grants coming out of the workforce development fund um, have been competitive grants, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, competitive grants are a good idea, but to not tie too many eligibility rules to that because our regions are so different. In the past, it's really been problematic, and a lot of rural workforce development organizations have felt left on the sidelines as far as being able to qualify and be eligible for certain grants and funding. Uh, so we would just recommend, you know, as you start thinking about these things and making some investments, uh, try to keep it as flexible as possible and just acknowledge the fact that there's a lot of differences uh, across uh, rural Minnesota um, in order to do what they need to do to make this work. The other thing, and this gets to at that stretch thin idea, right now a lot of state funding um, is really tied to kind of the client and the client being defined as uh, an unemployed individual. And there's, that's absolutely the way it should be. There's no problem with that. Um, but it also might be some use of tying some more funding towards engagement with employers. So how might employers and workforce development organizations engage un, uh, unemployed and individuals? Uh, I know at the federal level right now, they've been doing a lot of interesting things where they are essentially, if an employer and a workforce development organization get together and they find somebody that needs some training, but they can do kind of on the job training, there's federal money right now available to pay half that wage. So the business or the employer can take that risk hire somebody that needs training may not be a great fit, but not have to be fully committed in the wage side, at least for a while until they get trained up. Things like that are really, really interesting and helpful. Recommendation number three to think about is maybe tying some funding to help uh, unemployed folks have access to technology. That's kind of a no brainer, uh, but also hard to implement. And then the fourth one is find ways DEED can better assist in connecting the unemployed with their local workforce development uh, programming beyond emails. And this is not DEED's fault. Whenever we talk to workforce development organizations, they rave about DEED being absolutely fantastic and they're doing a great job. Right now, they're having conversations about how do they better connect um, uh, the local organizations with the unemployed at a time when everything's virtual and everything kind of has to be through emails. And I don't know the, the extent of it quite yet because I haven't dove in too deep on this end of things, but it sounds like there are some policy issues that are kind of making it difficult uh, to make this alignment work. And so this is more of a recommendation is if you guys get presented with things that could be changed, you have policy barriers or anything, or maybe even uh, resource investments that are needed in order to make this work, I would highly recommend figuring uh, uh, supporting that because this is probably the biggest disconnect uh, that we heard in our interviews with workforce development organizations is their inability right now to reach unemployed uh, individuals. It, 
if you guys were wondering, you're paying attention to central Minnesota, you would notice that central Minnesota kind of aligned close to the Twin Cities and it did its other uh, greater Minnesota areas. Uh, just keep in mind that the unemployment numbers are actually tied to residency. Uh, and central Minnesota is a huge commuting region. So we have a lot of folks that live in central Minnesota that work in the seven county metro. If they get laid off at their job in the seven county metro, it's counted as unemployed in central Minnesota. Uh, so that's why you're seeing like some big differences or why it didn't look like there were a lot of um, uh, occupation or workforce shortages in central Minnesota. That was due to there being that kind of weirdness in the data. Yeah, so with that, uh, uh, Chairman Nora, I am happy to take some questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here um, and uh, I appreciate the time. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ash. I think that was really informative to us uh, as we uh, discuss policy and also funding priorities. So uh, I appreciate the presentation. There's a lot of information that we got from here. Uh, members, we do have three bills, but I will open up for you know questions. I have uh, Representative Kutuza Watun. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I have two quick questions um, for either, um, either Mr. Ash or um, Ms. Hesh. And um, first one being, uh, when you're collecting that data, and I, I might have just not heard you say this, but do you collect data as people are leaving the um, leaving in a, in a place of employment, whether they were laid off or whether they were le leaving by personal choice due to like child care coverage concerns or, or anything like that? Do we have any more um, spe specificity? Mr. Ash. Yeah, Chairman Nor, Representative Whitlam. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. No, we don't have access to that data. Um, I wish I did because that would be that would be fantastic. <laughs> um, but, you know, a lot of that kind of uh, discussion around life impacts and why people are leaving the workforce is largely anecdotal. And, and uh, but I think, you know, just some the national research that I've seen where they've done a little bit more work around this, it seemed to line up pretty good. So, but yeah, I apologize. We don't have that data. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that. Uh, my second question being um, kind of con connected to the broad broadband and, and work from home situation that we all are finding ourselves in um, lately. I'm, I'm curious if uh, your, your center um, has been involved in any conversations about um, potential pockets of um, population growth for rural Minnesota, given um, you know, the, the trends in, in people continuing to work from home even beyond the pandemic and whether that you know, would lead to jobs in um, the rural workforce or people you know, working their job like you just mentioned, might be in the seven county metro area, but they're able to maybe live in a space that they've left and, and for work or for school and, and kind of return to their home base or just you know go and raise their family in another part of Minnesota um, after uh, after things are a little bit more safe. Mr. Ash? Yeah, Chairman Noor, uh, Representative, uh, it's, it's an exciting time. I, I really think this is a great opportunity for rural Minnesota uh, in terms of engaging a population that can telecommute, uh, and this is a, it's a big deal. The organization that's doing a lot of work around this is actually University of Minnesota Extension. They do a whole program around kind of resident recruitment and attraction, and that's one of the things they're looking into is what is the potential pool here. And again, mostly anecdotal, but they just did a survey, um, and from what we and they actually surveyed uh, real estate agents as well. And I know. Um, the top three questions that real estate agents are getting right now in, in home sales in rural Minnesota is how's the broadband? <laughs> and then uh, what's the daycare situation like? Those are kind of like the two things we hear a lot about um, uh, when it, in terms of that migration out. Uh, we're still waiting for census data to kind of the newest American Community Survey to help us kind of show what that data might look like. But anecdotally and what we're hearing and what we're seeing, um, it looks very promising that that trend is happening. People are moving to rural Minnesota. As far as pockets, I think northern Minnesota is always going to do well just because of its northern woods beauty and its attraction of people that like to be up there. Uh, but we're also just seeing it in southwest Minnesota and all kinds of places. So from all signs, it looks good. Um, and all signs say that, yeah, broadband is still incredibly important. So. Representative Kutuzawatun, any more questions? Thank you. Uh, the next person is Representative Haley, and then we'll have uh, Kegel, and the last one will be Hamil. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is for uh, Mr. Ash as well. Uh, I was really interested in, and pleased to have you call out this disconnect between um, you know, folks that are looking for work and, and the fact that we have uh, eliminated, I think, all of our requirements. Um, and I wanted to, to to know if you had any more 
data or insight based on your research on how other states have managed that? Is Minnesota an outlier in any case? And are there some best practices around the country as uh, states are looking to get unemployed folks back into the workforce? It's a Mr. great question. Oh, sorry. Go. Uh, thanks, Chairman Nor. Uh, Representative Haley, it's a great question. And no, I haven't taken a look at that yet. Um, but I'd be happy to over the next few weeks to try and pull something together. Okay. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ash. Um, I just think that's an incredible opportunity for us. And I'll be um, looking to do some work in that area. I've spoken with um, Jenny Rittman, who will be uh, is on your agenda later today to speak as well. I think the quicker that we can uh, focus our efforts there, the better off we're going to be long term. Thank you so much for your information today. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Representative Haley. The next person is uh, Kegel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I think my question goes to Mr. Ash as well. Um, I was just kind of curious about if you were able to parcel out the number of people who left the workforce due to kind of an early retirement. Um, I know my dad, you know, he was still working, but um, he's like, eh, you know, I'm, I'm old enough and, uh, you know, I've had, I'm set up, so I, I don't need to work. Um, and so I was just kind of curious if you have any thoughts on that. Mr. Ash? Yes. Yes, uh, Chairman Noor, uh, Representative Cagle, uh, thanks for the question. I do have thoughts on it. Unfortunately, I don't have good data on it. <laughs> um, it's kind of, again, that missing piece of the pie is like, what does that look like um, demographically? Uh, we have national data to show, particularly um, in recreational areas that typically where folks are a little bit older, maybe doing some part-time work, um, huge numbers of folks dropping out of the workforce, taking early retirement, or just kind of st uh, stepping aside and being like, I'm not going to risk it. And I think that's what you're seeing in Northeast Minnesota. In fact, I, I would give it a 90% chance that a big reason they see such a big drop off is because of that. Um, I think if I remember right, uh, that particular planning region has a median working age that's almost 10 years older than uh, most of other uh, rural, even rural Minnesota. Um, and, and that being an area in which there's a lot of connection between customers and, and the job you're doing, um, I think that's probably the, a big reason you're seeing it. But I don't have any local data, unfortunately, but I would be happy to pull together some of the national research that has come out uh, highlighting some of those demographic trends. And I don't know if you saw too, I think last month, I think it was the Bureau of Labor Statistics put out a report that in December, um, almost all of the people that dropped out of the workforce were female, which is kind of interesting as well. Representative Cagle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, that's spot on because my dad lives in Two Harbors. So that's kind of funny that you mentioned Northeast. Um, I also wanted to just clarify. Um, so when you were talking about the workforce surplus, that is too many workers, not enough jobs, right? Mr. Ash? That, uh, yeah, uh, Chairman Noor, uh, uh, Representative Cagle. Yes, that is, that's, that's exactly within right. those Within, within those, those occupations. Got it. Cool. Thank you. You bet. Uh, thank you, President Cagle. Uh, the last... Uh, uh, person will be Representative Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ash, thank you for the presentation. It, uh, timing was perfect. In fact, I had a phone call uh, last night uh, with uh, one of the mayors of the community that I represent. Um, I'm in District 22, Senate District 22, which borders Iowa and South Dakota. And there's uh, a group of mayors down there that are very concerned because Sioux Falls are building um, two, uh, two major businesses are moving in, Amazon and CJ Foods, that will require nearly 1,600 employees. And they teamed up with the tech school over there, and they started a Build Dakota Scholarship Fund. And so they're recruiting Minnesota students to go to college over there. And, and if those students agree to work uh, and, and stay living in South Dakota for three years, uh, they don't have to pay back that tuition. It's forgiven. And so the threat is very real. Uh, and uh, the mayors down in southwestern Minnesota are very concerned. Uh, they're already having trouble finding people. And so they're looking for some policy ideas and initiatives. What advice do you have for them? Mr. Ash? Yeah, Chairman Noor, Representative Hamilton. Uh, thanks for that question. And uh, actually, the part three of our workforce report I laugh because it's got multiple parts, but uh, part three uh, actually dove into the Build Dakota conundrum because uh, Southwest Minnesota has been very, very active in engaging high school students with careers. Um, a lot more kind of CTE happening in the high school, a lot of employers and 
uh, workforce development organizations in the high schools are getting together and, and developing programs to do this, to educate kids on like, hey, maybe you don't have to go to a four-year college. Maybe you don't have to leave. But as they're doing this education, you've got South Dakota right next door offering a program where they can go to that two-year college and get tuition paid and live there and work there for three years. Um, and so they're kind of, uh, it, it sounds terrible, but essentially kind of poaching from Minnesota with the good work that's going on down in Southwest Minnesota. Um, so we've actually, uh, over the past few years, have been trying to urge people to start talking more about a Build Dakota type program. Honestly, Minnesota has a more robust two-year college system. There's great partnerships between uh, workforce development organizations and employers and high schools. Um, and the two-year colleges are chomping at the bit, I think, to do something interesting because it's comp competition for them as well. And one of the things that's interesting about Build Dakota that I really got enamored by is that there was, you know, obviously some state funding and then one big foundation, but one big funder that put a bunch of money into it. But they've also had community groups and businesses donate into this program as well. And so, for example, if you're a plumbing business and you have this great high school student that's been working with you, you could approach the Build Dakota program and say, hey, I will pay for this student's half of their tuition um, to get them through college if they'll continue to work for me, right? So you have also all these business, a way for these businesses to start contributing uh, to the tuition and the cost of the student as well. I just think there's amazing uh, opportunity there because of the infrastructure Minnesota has in place, both education-wise, employer-wise, and philanthropic organizations that are super involved in rural Minnesota. So that would be honestly just even just from a personal standpoint, I, I would really like to see us do more around that because I think it's very, very the potential there is great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the test fires. Uh, thank you so much uh, to Kelly Ash and Julie Tesh for your presentation. We look forward to uh, implementing some of the suggestion recommendation that you presented. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, members, we will proceed to the first bill. Uh, we have Representative uh, Petersburg bill, which is uh, House File 410. Uh, Rep Representative uh, Petersburg, I move your bill, House File 410, to be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Uh, please uh, introduce yourself to the committee and welcome, uh, and tell us about your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm State Representative John Petersburg, and I have uh, uh, this bill in front of me uh, that really re kind of keys in on some of the things that we just heard. Uh, oftentimes, we hear about unemployment, but we don't always look at unemployment versus jobs available. And if the mismatch is there, uh, obviously, you see we have a surplus of employer employees, but they don't have the skills to actually uh, grow into those jobs. I sometimes call it, and I think you've heard the term, underemployment. Uh, in which we have less skilled jobs, uh, people that are in those uh, and entry level jobs, and they no longer have a job available, but they have the ability to learn uh, and go into other occupations. And so one of the things that, that this bill does is that in Otana area and Steel County area, uh, we lost our uh, economic development or workforce development uh, program here a few years ago, and we would like to reinstate that. And so uh, the bill requests $275,000 each of the next two years, just for those two years, uh, as a grant uh, from the fund uh, to the Workforce Development Center uh, to really put forth that particular program. And with that, I'm going to stop and let my testifiers kind of introduce themselves, and et cetera, uh, as well, uh, Mr. Chair, and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you are muted, Mr. I'm Chair. muted. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Representative Pittsburgh, for your presentation for that bill. So you have uh, Ms. Davis, I believe, uh, as the first testifier. I'm not sure if that if it's uh, Ms. Actually, Davis or Ms. Reitman. It's it's up to Ms. Reitman. Yep. Uh, please uh, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself and proceed. All right. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Thank you for your time today and. I should say thank you to Mr. Ash too, because he he really made my case, made, made our case for us here today. Um, my name is Jenny Rittman and I am the Executive Director for Workforce Development Incorporated and for the Workforce Development Board of Southeast Minnesota. Thank you all for allowing me to speak on behalf of this bill, which seeks to support a workforce development office, programs and services for career seekers and employers in Steele County. 
This bill would provide the job skills training in high demand careers to low income parents, dislocated workers, new Americans and other targeted populations, helping families out of poverty while addressing work for worker shortages. Today, I am representing Steel County residents, job seekers, local businesses, and our community partners. We want to reopen the Owatonna Career Force Center. In 2019, this group stood before you with my predecessor, Randy Johnson at the time, requesting the 275,000 per year from the Workforce Development Fund due to the ever-increasing needs of the business community, as well as the growing skills gap between career seekers and job opportunities. We come before you again today because this need not only still exists, but it is actually growing, as you've already heard as well. Um, the Oatana Workforce Center closed its doors to the public in April of 2018. And I'd like to highlight that Oatana is really the only community of its size in Minnesota that doesn't have a career force center any, any longer. Approximately half of the locations in the state are located in communities with 6,000 or less residents. And due to shrinkage in federal appropriations and a lack of um, public funding resources, we were forced to close. Even with that closure though, we did provide and we have been providing services to Steel County residents and employers, utilizing a skeleton crew and with the additional support of community partners. However, the, the services being provided are vastly disproportionate to the needs of the community. Especially now more than ever before, it's imperative that Steel County career seekers have access to our services that businesses have an ally in programming to fill those skills gaps, and that we collaborate um, with educators in a way that benefits both employers and career seekers. Oatana is such a vibrant community open to the kinds of innovative programming that our agency can offer its career seekers and employers alike. So just a little background on the Workforce Development Fund, you know, as you know, it's dedicated to provide employment transition services, support services, and training for in-demand careers. The workforce shortage continues to be the main challenge for our region and particularly to Owatonna and Steel County due to significant economic and business growth. The other major challenge that we run into is skills alignment. This is where workforce programming is absolutely critical. Our work focuses on helping individuals gain those skills necessarily necessary for the in-demand careers. A quick analysis of the Workforce Development Fund shows that approximately 20,000 individuals are employed in Steel County paying into that fund with an estimated cont contribution of 400,000 to the Workforce Development Fund by means of employee wages. Currently, we're utilizing about $85,000 in benefits from the Workforce Development Fund in Steel County. Our contributions, less benefits creates a shortfall. Now I realize that the math that I just gave you, it's not scientific math, but even a quick estimate does show that Oatana and Steel County are economic drivers for the region, yet are not gaining the services and programs justified for an area of that size and magnitude. Funds from this bill would be used for program expenses, including instructors and navigators, space rental, supportive services to help participants attend classes, assistance with training costs, childcare, transportation, et cetera. In addition, funding for businesses to provide uh, incumbent worker training, on-the-job training, and work experience, opportunities that are win-win for job seekers and employers alike. Our main emphasis in Southeast Minnesota is on career pathways training opportunities, working with individuals where they are at, providing short-term training into family-sustaining in-demand careers in the region. WDI, we've actually been nationally recognized for some of our Career Pathways training programs, and we would use these funds to expand these offerings and positively impact the overall economic vitality of the region. I'd now like to read just a quick testimonial from one of our participants in Oatana. Workforce development has been a valuable resource for me as I have navigated starting my private practice in nutrition and wellness. I continue to network and spread the word about my business as much as possible. I presented to a local Rotary chapter a couple weeks ago and I have an Oatana Business Women's presentation coming up. I am currently offering a workout challenge and I'm providing classes for Oatana Community Ed. I'm looking forward to enhancing my marketing and sales. I also just started an on-call position and start training next week. Thank you for being proactive and helping me support services and navigating unemployment benefits, budgeting, and new employment opportunities, as well as helping me start my own business. I am really hopeful about the future of my business, but I know it will take time. I am saying yes to every opportunity I can. So with that, I'd just like to thank you again, Mr. Chairman and committee members. I would also like to thank Representative Peter Petersburg for his support and for the opportunity to speak with you today. And then I would like to introduce um, Jim Kingsley, who is the Senior Vice President of Operations for Winger Corporation in Owatonna.
Mr. Kinsley, uh, please uh, welcome to the committee and introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Jim Kingsley. I'm the Senior Vice President of Operations with Wayner Corporation in Owatonna, and also the Vice President of the Workforce Board um, in Southeast Minnesota. Uh, as a board member and a business leader in Steele County, I wanted to express the need for a career force center in Steele County in Owatonna. The Steele County region has the need to develop workers as we continue to experience a limited pool of skilled workers. This has been accelerated, fortunately, by businesses in the region growing and new businesses coming to the region. I've been intimately involved in the development of a program called Steel County Works. In this program, our Steel County businesses have partnered with workforce development to create a successful career pathway for Steel County high school students seeking education, short-term training, career counseling, job shadowing, internships, and work experiences. We have seen the benefits of this program, but it is, not, it is only one aspect of the efforts needed to close the gap in the skilled workers in the area. We are asking for the same opportunity for Steele County adults who find themselves currently unemployed or underemployed. Currently access to resources for displaced workers in Steele County is limited, resulting in the need to travel to Faribault to access needed services. With approval of this bill, the workforce development team can better service the demand with improved local access and additional capacity. This team wants to be able to better serve their clients and businesses with needed services. This Career Force Center would expand the great efforts and accomplishments of the workforce development team and would be an asset to our community. Thank you for this opportunity. Next, I'd like to introduce Brad Meyer, the president of the Owatonna Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Brad Meyer, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman and committee members. Uh, I'm Brad Meyer with the Owatonna Chamber of Commerce. Appreciate your time today and uh, your consideration. Thank you, Representative Petersburg, for uh, bringing this to everyone's attention today as well. So, uh, you know, we, we are really positive right now about where things are at in our region. Um, it's been referenced here, the growth. We we had three new businesses located here and over 500 new jobs in the last year um, present themselves. Costco Distribution Center, Rise Modular and Minimizer are three brand new businesses and then the expansion of Dyke and Applied, Bosch, Revel Greens and Bushel Boy Farms. So we're contending as a regional cen center, but our challenge continues as you've been hearing all day today around workforce and the need to grow. Um, you know, it's it it's interesting to me that our even our our uh, Minnesota State College presence here is minimal. We have no workforce center. It really feels like a huge oversight uh, for a region that is 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 on the move here. Our partnership with workforce development and career force has been uh, talked about here. This Steel Co Works program has been outstanding um, in the work of. Workforce development is has just a very high reputation here in our community and have been an excellent partner for the business community here as well. Um, you know, this partnership with Steel Co. Works, we've got about 100 businesses that are involved in some way, shape, or form, uh, whether it's dollars, whether it's providing opportunities, um, or just their counsel and insight. So, yeah. There's been, a, there's been a huge effort here and to be able to have a workforce center here to assist in so many more ways than we currently have today is really, I think, vitally important to our growth. So I'll just wrap up by saying there's a lot going on in Steele County right now. Uh, most of it is very positive for the state and for the region. And we're asking for the same support that communities our size and smaller all around the state are receiving already. So thank you for your consideration today. And our next uh, speaker is Phil Sales with our largest employer, Viracon. Good afternoon, welcome uh, Mr. Phil Sales and uh, please proceed. Thank you, Chairman and committee members. Uh, my, name is, my name is Phil Sales and uh, I'm representing uh, Viracon. Uh, in Owatonna, Minnesota, and we are a fabricator of architectural glass. Uh, basically, we make uh, large, 
large windows for, for large buildings. And we employ about 1600 people. Um, we're celebrating our 50th, our 50th year this year. Um, and that's kind of the, the story around the, the business park is that we have a lot of great, great employers who have, have been here for generations and others that are, are recognizing that and kind of coming in. Um, and uh, um, as businesses in Steele County and Owatonna continue to grow, uh, it's gonna be critical that we have a trained and available workforce. Uh, we've partnered with WDI over the years to, to recruit, train, develop, uh, and build a diverse workforce within our community. Um, I've seen firsthand the, the value that the workforce centers uh, and the career navigators have brought to the surrounding communities. Um, and I look forward to uh, the day we can have that resource locally here in Steele County. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sales. Uh, who is the next testifier? Is it uh, Ms. Copeland? Um, Mr. Chair, I believe we're actually finished. Oh, thank you so much. Um, members, uh, you've had the testimony. Uh, if you have any questions for the bill author or the testifier. Representative Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Representative Petersburg. Thank you for bringing this bill forward. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to all the testifiers. Um, this isn't easy coming on these Zoom meetings to testify, but I wanna say that your testimony has been very impactful. I appreciate it. Thank you for being involved and, and uh, bringing this bill forward. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Hamilton. Uh, saying no, any other question from the members? I really appreciate uh, the conversation about how we should be funding uh, workforce development centers, especially knowing that we do have conversation that we will have with the department in regards to how we should prioritize the workforce development fund. Uh, so this bill is going to be laid over for possible inclusion and we'll have more conversation uh, down the road. Uh, Representative Peters back, uh, any closing remarks? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I do thank you and the committee for hearing this bill. And I, I do thank you for uh, what I hope is a positive uh, result in your final financial uh, omnibus bill. I, I just wanted to remind them that uh, prior to 2019 and 2018, when we had workforce development, you could see that there are a lot of uh, groups working together uh, along with them. And if nothing else, I think we should reinstate it and and see whether or not this could be maybe more of a pilot for all of the state to be looking at. Because I know this is a statewide issue. It's not just us and it's just not because of COVID related as well. Um, we're, we're gonna be dealing with this for a while. And I think this is a good opportunity for us to find ways in which we can work with others. And I know that um, workforce development has that opportunity to do that in Steel County. So I just ask for your positive impact. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you committee for hearing this bill. Uh, thank you, Representative Petersburg. I renew my motion that House File 410 be laid over for, for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Uh, thank you, uh, members. Uh, we now have House File 254 uh, from Representative Lis, uh, Lisligan. So uh, this uh, bill will be the next one. Uh, and I move the motion uh, that House File 524 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Welcome, uh, Representative Lisnagad. Uh, please introduce yourself and tell us about your bill. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Dave Lisnagad. I'm a state representative for 6B. And uh, before I begin, just um, I'd, I'd be lying if I said I didn't get a little giddy to uh, sit and listen to this uh, committee hearing about Greater Minnesota and uh, some of the opportunity and some of the challenges that we face. Um, um, House File 524 is pretty straightforward. It uh, it takes 1.155 million for fiscal year 2022 and 1.55 million out of fiscal 23 are appropriated from the general fund to deed um, for grant for the Arrowhead Economic Opportunity Agency for Rural Ride Program. And uh, in greater Minnesota, this, this program, which you're gonna hear from my two testifiers has been extremely um, successful. And uh, I think it's better coming from them to give you the background. It's been around for about 10 years and uh, it is a program that is very much needed and we are looking forward to uh, it continuing with this, uh, this funding. So with that, Mr. Chair, I would turn that over to my two testifiers. I'm not sure who you would like to go first. Uh, thank you, Representative Lissagat. I do have uh, 
uh, Jack Larson. Uh, yep. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Jack Larson. I'm the transit director at AU8 Arrowhead Transit. And uh, I'll just give a, just a brief overview. Again, we're talking about our Rural Rides Program. Uh, the Rural Rides Program started in 2008 with a, a federal grant from the uh, Federal Transit Administration. It was called JARC, J-A-R-C, and it stands for Job Access Reverse Commute. Uh, we did the uh, job access part of that. Uh, what we did and what our Rural Rides Program provided was rights to work, rights to job interviews, rights to work training. And again, in 2008, when we started off, we were in three counties. Uh, we had very or moderately high unemployment. And as we went along, we added this into seven counties because of, it, of its success. And again, the, pro the program is in Northeastern Minnesota. Uh, going along in 2014, 2015, and 2016, this program plateaued with its rise. And again, we talked about when this program would end because of the uh, uh, decreasing unemployment. And we came up that we were gonna end the program in 2019 if, if the trends continued. Uh, we got to 2019 and again, very successful and we were going to end it. Uh, Representative Sandstead convinced us to do one more year of this in a limited fashion. And we did that through 2020. Uh, and in 2020, the program ended. Uh, then the pandemic happened. And looking at this from an agency perspective, we felt that with the pandemic and getting back to normalcy, we're gonna need this program again. Mm -hmm. And we sent out a map or maps. I don't know if the, uh, the committee uh, received those or not, but okay. And they're not maps, they'll just stand up because there's no narrative with them. But we just wanted to give a, a definition of where we would be looking to provide the service at. Again, uh, the three counties we would expand to would be Pine County, Chisago, and Isanti counties uh, if, we, uh, if we were awarded this. But again, getting back to the pandemic, a, a very positive feeling that people are gonna need rides to get back to work. They're gonna need to go to job interviews. Uh, they may need to get to college. They may need to get anything that's work related. And uh, that's kind of where we're at with this. And at that, I'll turn this over to Colette. Ms. Hansen, welcome to the committee and uh, introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Colette Hansen and I'm a transit manager here for Arrowhead Transit. And as Jack stated, our rural rights program began in 2008. And then in 2020, you know, it started going on the downside, but how we, I just how the program works is that all applicants are either at 200% at the federal poverty guideline. It is preferred, but it is not a requirement of rural rights programs. We're here to help anybody that needs help with their transportation, getting to work related activities, seeking work interviews and everything. And how it goes is that they would meet up with a transportation advocate and they would come up with an individual transportation plan to help individuals get transfer, transportation sufficient on their own within a three month time period. Now, if they were reaching that mark and it's three months and they were so close, it could be extended for a period of time. And it, we would either help them uh, for three months or up to, uh, $1,250 and how those funds are being used is by setting up transportation, either using taxis, bus tickets, or a, um, a volunteer driver. And um, the advocate will meet with the applicant on a monthly basis to see where they are. They will update the plan and they will help them move forward and um, give them the tools available to help them find work and help them if they need help with interview skills, that's what our advocates would do. They would like do the research and reach out. So there's more to this plan, rural rights than just transportation. It's also somebody helping individuals how to perform once, you know, for like a job interview. So, 
And like I said, going forward, if they needed help for extension, it is supposed to only last for three months, but it could be extended. So that's a little about how the program works. So if anybody has any questions, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Ms. Hansen. And uh, members, any discussion? Rep Representative Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Representative uh, Liz Lagarde, it's good to see you. And thank you to the testifiers. Just a, a little more information on the program. Um, the, the ask is 1.155 million, I believe. And what's the, the total budget, annual budget of this program? And second, secondly, um, roughly how many people on an annual basis does it serve? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lassen or Ms. Hansen, anyone who can respond to that question? I um, like pre -co during COVID, our numbers did drop. But for instance, like in uh, 2019, we served uh, 838 applicants in our the, uh, seven counties that we were in. And then the 1.1 million is what it cost for to run the program for the whole year, considering setting up, uh, you know, the operations and then also the staff um, to support the program. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to the testifiers. Thank you. No, th thank you so much. I think it's also important for us to look into the challenges that uh, Greater Minnesota is also facing uh, during COVID-19 pandemic and uh, appreciate Representative Liz Legard for bringing this bill forward. Uh, do you have any closing remarks, uh, Representative Liz Legard? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, just uh, I appreciate you guys looking at the whole state. Uh, one Minnesota and uh, some of the challenges and successes um, that we all share together as a state. So go greater Minnesota. I appreciate any support I could get. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Representative Liz Lagarde and to the testifiers. Uh, I renew my motion that House File 524 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. So thank you so much. Uh, members, our final bill uh, is in regards with childcare. We've had so much about the challenges. In fact, myself, if I didn't have a, a good process of I working from home, I would not have been able to do my job. So uh, it's critical uh, that we pay attention to the challenges that many people are facing. Uh, I wanted to welcome uh, Representative Olson to move her bill and uh, proceed. Representative Olson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to be clear, the motion, I want to make sure I have the motion collect is to go to the child care committee. Is that, is that your? That, that's correct. We refer to uh, early childhood finance and policy. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I move house file 413. To be referred to early to childhood finance. Yes. Uh, members, uh, the motion is House file 413 to be referred to early childhood finance and policy. And uh, please uh, proceed, uh, Representative Olson, and introduce thank, your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. So it's no surprise, especially after what we heard today, that our entire state is facing a child care crisis, both around affordability and access. And child care, or the lack thereof in greater Minnesota, is one of the most significant economic de development barriers we face. In greater Minnesota, there's currently about 39,000 childcare slots uh, that we are short, which is a significant amount. And when you ask employers what is holding them back from expanding their business or locating their business in a community, the top three answers are they can't find the workers they need, their employees can't find housing, and their employees can't get childcare. Since 1986, when they were created, the six initiative foundations have been charged with addressing the economic challenges of the regions they serve, and they have done so with significant success. Just during the pandemic alone, the MIF stepped up and created an emergency grant program for child care providers that filled the gap between the start of the pandemic and when the legislature was able to establish the child care provider emergency grants that have propped up the industry since May. They've also partnered with DEED to administer the small business grants and loan programs that have helped so many of our Main Street employers weather the last year. Childcare is nothing new to the MIFs and all of them have worked to support the industry in their region for a numbers of year, number of years with great success. These funds will allow them to continue their work and grow their capacity to do their work. 
So the six initiative foundations are uniquely positioned to do this precise work in greater Minnesota. So House File 413 provides $4 million to the six initiative foundations to support their existing work to address the child care shortage in greater Minnesota. The funds can be used to facilitate community-based planning to address local shortages, engage the private sector to invest local resources in building child care capacity, provide training and technical support to child care providers needed to build successful, sustainable, and profitable businesses, and assist providers to achieve parent aware. So with, this, with possible success laid out in this bill, our employers no longer have to decide whether to grow or locate in a community based on the availability of child care. And with success, our families no longer have to decide whether to work or where to work based on the availability of child care. And with that, Mr. Chair, I have two testifiers uh, to explain more. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Representative Olson. I know you have two, uh, Mr. Scott, uh and uh, Ms. Anderson. Uh, so please uh, uh, welcome to the committee, introduce yourself and proceed. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. My name is Scott McMahon. I'm the executive director of the Greater Minnesota Partnership, which is a collaboration of businesses, uh, chambers of commerce, local governments, uh, higher education, uh, foundations and nonprofits across Greater Minnesota who care about the economic prosperity for our communities. And one of the things that we really care about is the impact that the child care crisis is having in our region. As Representative Olson indicated, we are short almost 40,000 child care slots across all of greater Minnesota. And I know we have a, a child care crisis in all of Minnesota, but the way it manifests itself in greater Minnesota is different than what we see in the metro. In the metro, the child care crisis is, is largely one of affordability. People can, can find child care, but they simply can't afford it. In greater Minnesota, in many cases, we don't even have the child care available at any cost. We have examples of entire cities that, that do not have a single child care provider within their uh, city borders. And in greater Minnesota, it is extremely difficult to build a child care business that can actually be profitable. So that, those are two of the things that are driving this 39,000 child care slot deficit that we see. Um, as a result of, of these differences in the markets, the interventions that we need in greater Minnesota are different than what we see as, as to what's needed in, in the metropolitan area. The investment that we see in this bill to give the six initiative foundations the resources they need to help stabilize our childcare industry and grow the number of spots available for our families and our employees will have a significant impact on the childcare crisis in, in our communities. You're probably wondering a little bit why we're before the jobs committee. Um, I think the, the presentations you heard from uh, Mr. Ash uh, earlier give you an indication as to why why child care intersects with jobs and workforce development and employment ex expansion in greater Minnesota uh, quite significantly. But just to add a little bit more into what he had to say, um, in greater Minnesota, we have thousands of good paying job openings right now. But the reason we can't fill those positions is either we don't have the employees in those communities who have the skills that those employers are looking for, or we can't recruit those employees to move to our communities. And one of the biggest reasons we can't recruit the employees to come to us is because of the childcare shortage. When we recruit workers, they're typically younger workers, typically have younger families, or they don't have a family yet, they plan to uh, as, they, as they age. And one of the things they're gonna be looking for in relocating to a community is whether or not there's adequate childcare accessible to them. If we don't have it, the employees won't come. If the employees won't come, then the employers will be forced with one of two decisions. Either they're gonna to decide to grow their business somewhere else, or they're gonna to decide to pick up their business completely and move somewhere else uh, and, and relocate in, in that situation. Neither of these are a good situation for greater Minnesota and neither of them are a good situation for Minnesota as a whole. When greater Minnesota's communities lose an employer, it can take a generation for that community to recover uh, from the economic loss that they, that they experience in that situation. And so, you know, the things that, that get tied into this, the child care shortage do have significant impacts on, on what's happening in our economies and the health and vitality of, of our cities and our families. When we look at, at the way to intervene here and the partnership that the state can have with initiative foundations, the work can be significant. The MIFs have an almost 40 year history of building economies in greater Minnesota. And as Representative Olson indicated, we don't need to look back very far to see what they've done. The work that they did in the childcare uh, industry in the early days of the pandemic 
was remarkable. It built that bridge before the state could step in and build out the child care provider grants that have been ongoing uh, since, since May. Uh, we've also seen tremendous work that they've done with our small Main Street businesses throughout the pandemic. As regional entities, they know our businesses, they know our local governments, they know our communities. They can bring all these factors together uh, to make these dollars work to the best of their ability. They're also already doing this work. We're not asking them to do anything new. We're asking them to do more of what they've been doing. We have seen tremendous success over the past decade with the work that they're doing. They're just lacking the resources they need to take it fully up to scale. This investment will help them uh, grow those programs and have a bigger impact in all of our communities. The MIFs also bring people together. They have partnerships with, with statewide organizations that they can bring into a community to leverage their ability to have an impact in those settings. And finally, they have a tremendous ability to raise local resources. If they can go forward to the communities and say, you know what, we have $4 million to address the child care crisis in the greater Minnesota, our communities will step up and match those dollars. As a result, we'll have a leveraging of the dollars and have a bigger impact than just what the $4 million alone can bring. Now, I don't want to say that this bill is going to solve the child care crisis. It's a much bigger issue and, and one that the whole legislature and the administration need to address. But this bill and the investment it makes will allow our communities to take short-term steps needed to stabilize the child care industry as we all work together to find the solution to the larger crisis. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. McMahon. And uh, we have Ms. Anderson, if uh, she can proceed and then uh, we'll come back to the questions. Yes, Chair Noor, uh, members of the committee, I'm Diana Anderson and I'm the president and CEO of the Southwest Initiative Foundation. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify regarding House File 413. And uh, thank you so much to Representative Olson for authoring the bill. Um, I also want to thank Kelly Ash from the Center for Rural Policy for providing excellent context for my content, uh, comments as well. Um, as Representative Olson noted, the six Minnesota Initiative Foundations, known collectively as the MIFs, uh, were created in 1986 in response to the economic crisis that decimated our rural communities. Um, my husband and I were young farmers at the time uh, here in Southwest Minnesota, and re we remember what uh, a, a terrible time that was in our rural communities. Um, since then, uh, the Minnesota Initiative Foundations have invested uh, more than $259 million in grants and $299 million in loans uh, to support the social and economic well being of Greater Minnesota. Um, we work with public and private sector partners to implement community led solutions to the complex issues facing our cities and towns. And we're extremely grateful for the legislature's support in 2019 through an allocation of $120,000 per initiative foundation to provide child care technical assistance and community planning in our regions, especially within our Black, Indigenous, and communities of color. Um, the, as, as noted, the Minnesota Initiative Foundations have been committed to intentionally investing in young children and their families uh, for more than 17 years through our early childhood work. And after the Center for Rural Policy and Development released their 2016 report on the critical lack of access to childcare in Minnesota, we really doubled down on efforts to reverse closures and add needed childcare slots. And I know that Mr. McMahon had provided you with um, a handout and it uh, features the story of the Candy Ojai County Area Family YMCA, uh, which is really a perfect example of the public private nonprofit partnership uh, that um, we uh, are part of that created 90 slots in 2019. Um, however, uh, the pandemic has had a profoundly negative impact on rural child, child care providers, and we lost some of the progress that had been made in creating those new slots. Um, both center and family-based providers were really hit hard in that initial shutdown last spring. And on March 19th, Governor Waltz had reached out and asked if the MIFs uh, could help in supporting local providers for that bridge. Uh, we quickly secured $600,000 from the Minnesota Disaster Recovery Fund of the Minnesota Council on Foundations, uh, which was uh, a collaborative effort on the part of uh, Minnesota philanthropy uh, to respond immediately to the crisis uh, that was unfolding um, as a result of the pandemic. And then each of the Minnesota Initiative Foundations matched that with $50,000 of our own. 
and then went out into the community and raised additional dollars from individual and corporate donors. So literally within weeks, uh, working from uh, home offices that were scattered all over greater Minnesota, we were able to provide um, $1.85 million through 2014 grants to providers serving 18,046 children of essential workers across greater Minnesota. Um, this really speaks, I think, to our deep connections in communities and our flexibility and our ability to leverage dollars in the community. Um, we know childcare is essential to the economic recovery in our rural communities. Um, there was a report released by the Minneapolis Federal Reserve on February 2nd uh, that confirms really what we hear anecdotally. Um, women left the labor market to care for children when the pandemic hit, and they have not returned in the same numbers as men. Um, according to the report, mothers in the 9th Federal Reserve District who have young children participated in the labor force at much lower rates during September through November 2020 compared with the same period a year earlier. And uh, specifically in Minnesota, um, labor force participation among yet mothers with young children dropped by 11.1 percentage points um, here in Minnesota. Um, and for non-college educated parents, the impact is really substantial. We know that when people leave the workforce, they do not necessarily return to the same level of earnings that they left. Uh, this has really a disproportionate impact on low-income families, and it can take years for them to recover lost earnings, really, if ever. Um, so quoting from the report, we often discuss the childcare sector and early childhood development in terms of their long-run benefits for children and therefore the long-run health of our society and economy. But childcare also matters in the here and now, as been made painfully clear by the pandemic recession. While fathers of young children have regained, regained most of their labor force participation losses, mothers have not, and many remain on the labor market sidelines. Childcare availability and parental concerns over childcare safety and affordability during the pandemic will affect how quickly labor markets and the economy recover. Um, as you've heard today, there are jobs out here waiting to be filled. Manufacturing, including food processing, fared relatively well through the pandemic. Uh, and those employers report continued shortages. I serve on the Southwest Workforce Development Board and at our meeting last week, uh, we heard from employers across the region um, reporting that they have jobs available um, and are having a really difficult time um, finding the workforce that they need. So uh, HR 413 will provide additional funding for technical assistance and community planning. It also provides for professional development opportunities that encourage participation in the parent aware quality improvement rating sit system. And uh, as uh, it should, it requires the MIFs to leverage their funding with private sector and other local investments. Uh, it's something we know how to do and do well. Uh, Mr. Chair and committees of the uh, members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Anderson. Uh, members, uh, we will be voting this bill out of the committee. So we have two questions and we've got three minutes. So hopefully we can get it done quickly. Uh, Representative Kutizo Tun. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Representative Olson, for bringing this bill forward. Um, <laughs> I, um, I also want to thank uh, Mr. McMahon and Ms. Anderson for the wonderful work that the MIFs do all across the state. And I, I, I'm a member also of the Early Childhood Committee, so I look forward to continuing the conversation there. Since we're short on time, I just wanted to um, express my support and my gratitude. And um, this, this area is just this intersection, I think, between workforce and business development and childcare and childhood is one of the most important um, issues that we're going to talk about um, in committee this year. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Cortizo Tun, uh, Representative Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know we're short on time. Thank you, Representative Olson, for bringing this forward. Uh, the uh, the need is great out there when it comes to child care. We heard that. I would also like to say hi to uh, uh, Ms. Anderson. Thank you. Uh, hopefully we get to see, uh, see each other in person here before too long. So thank you to the testifiers. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to uh, Representative Olson. Did you have any final remarks? No, I can just renew my motion that House File 413 be referred to the Early Childhood Finance and Policy Committee. And thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Representative Olson. She uh, Representative Olson renews her motion House File 413 be referred to Early Childhood Finance and Policy. And I also wanted to thank uh, the testifiers uh, 
Scott, uh, Mr. Scott McMahon, and also uh, Ms. Anderson. Thank you so much. The legislative assistant uh, will take the role. Chair Noor. Aye. Vice Chair Ji Shong. Aye. Lead Hamilton. Aye. Representative Baker is excused. Daphne. Aye. Frankie. Aye. Greenman. Aye. Representative Haley is excused. Jurgens. Aye. Cagle. Aye. Patiza Watoon. Aye. Olson. Aye. Tu Zhang. Aye. Eleven eyes to excuse, Mr. Chair. Uh, the motion prevails. Uh, the bill has been referred to the Ali Chad Hood. Uh, members, we don't have any other items in front of us. Uh, so with that, uh, the meeting for workforce and business development is now adjourned. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.